Greetings. This is Mike Grundman. I'm professor of Western Nordics in the Viterbi School of Engineering at the University of Southern California. Today we will be talking about uh, how our students can apply knowledge that they're getting in our astronautical engineering courses, how they can apply this knowledge to the real world problems. In particular, we'll look at our class AST520 spacecraft systems design and we will apply it to the very interesting, important, and consequential event that happened two months ago, the launch of uh, the first artificial satellite by North Korea. So, as many of you know, two months ago, on December 12, uh, 2012, the, uh, North Korea successfully launched its first artificial satellite. They used the three-stage rocket launcher, UNHA-3, UNHA stands for Galaxy in Korean, and they put a satellite, Kwang Myung Song 3, into orbit. The satellite apparently failed after the launch. It was the fifth uh, attempt by North Korea to put a satellite into orbit, and they finally succeeded. They also succeeded before South Korea launched its satellite only two weeks ago, on January 30th, 2013. So this uh, uh, photo shows the launch of the rocket, and on the right side in the top there is a satellite. So when uh, this event occurred, many talking heads in the media and the self-described pundits, but not all, they dismissively jeered at the successful launch by North Korea and tried to play down its impact. Similar reaction often greeted uh, what uh, North Koreans did uh, during their tests of satellite launches and the ballistic missile tests in the past. Now, just an example, uh, uh, a story title in the media, North Korea is still years away from reliable missiles, or successful launch does mean that Pyongyang is close to having an intercontinental ballistic missile. Well, uh, let us leave to others to decide whether some pundits are simply uninformed or pursue an agenda like be belonging to an appeasement wing or political or diplomatic uh, establishment. What is important that miscalculation in this area is very dangerous and consequential. So what we will do in this talk, we'll we will concentrate on technical issues, technical aspects of what North Korea did. So this is basically an example of how students taking AST-520 spacecraft design can apply this, what they learn in this class, to um, uh, this North Korean launch. And uh, this class is a very big. Uh, it's uh, almost uh, 1,100 graduate students took this course uh, during the last 10 years. So the first thing that we need to evaluate this launch, we'll go and uh, get two line elements of the orbits, known as LSATs, and uh, anybody can get them from space track. So these uh, two line elements are shown here. Uh, they were obtained two days after the launch on December 14th. From these two line elements, we can immediately see that the inclination of the or satellite orbit was 97 degrees, a right ascension of ascending node is here, a eccentricity was uh, 0.006, and uh, the satellite completed slightly more than 15 revolutions per day. From the last number, we can immediately establish the orbital period, which is 1 hour, 35 minutes, and 26 seconds. So the orbit is nearly circular and retrograde. So now, let's just uh, continue. From the orbital period, we can immediately get the semi-major axis of the orbit, and calculate radius of perigee and, and the radius of apogee. So the satellite altitude of perigee of the satellite is 498 kilometers, and the altitude of apogee is 582 kilometers. So uh, solar activity is unusually low during this solar cycle, 11-year solar cycle, which reduces the atmospheric density and satellite drag. So one can expect that the satellite, this Korean satellite, KMS-2, Kwang myung sang uh, um, uh, 3 actually, uh, orbit, uh, its orbit will only slowly lose its altitude with time. The next thing that we can calculate is to look at the regression of nodes, and the regression of nodes is the rotation of the line of nodes. And line of nodes connects 
uh, the position of the ascending node of the orbit as it goes up to the north with the point where the orbit crosses the equator again going south with the descending node. So the line of nodes rotates due to ablateness of the Earth. We can immediately calculate that and for this satellite we get uh, immediately the answer 0.966 degrees per day or roughly 353 degrees per year. If we uh, look at the possible effect of the moon and the sun, it is very small and it can be disregarded. So the next question that we should ask, is this orbit of the Korean satellite, North Korean satellite, is it a sun-synchronous orbit? Why is it important? Because sun-synchronous orbits are favored by remote sensing and reconnaissance satellites. Such an orbit has a feature that when a satellite flies over a ground, it observes what is on the ground, takes pictures, for instance, uh, under similar illumination conditions. The sun shines always from the same direction. So then when you compare photographs, pictures obtained at different moments of time, different days of the year, under similar illumination conditions, it is very convenient to compare them and you can extract a lot of uh, information. So for sun synchronous orbits, as we learn in the classes, the regression of nodes must be 0 0.9856 degrees per day. So let's consider the orbit of the Korean satellite with the semi-image axis as we obtained in our previous slides and the eccentricity that again we got from the space track. So, and we ask a question, at what inclination would such an orbit be sun-synchronous? It's a very uh, a simple problem, like a homework problem in our course, and we will get answer, 97.55 degrees. Again, if we look at the effect of the moon and the sun, uh, their contribution would be very, very small. We can disregard that. Now, the Korean satellite, instead of 97.55 degrees, uh, got the inclination 97.4 degrees. So the difference between the sun synchronous orbit inclination and the Korean satellite is 0.14 degrees, one seventh of one degree, very small error. So it seems from our analysis we can immediately conclude that North Korea likely tried to launch a satellite into a sun synchronous orbit, which is again favored for reconnaissance satellites. Previous all right, so, so let's now go to the next slide and ask a question. Is this orbit a repeating orbit? Repeating orbits are also favored by reconnaissance and remote sensing satellites. Why is that? Because they allow to fly exactly over the same point, point of interest, uh, say every day or every two days or every week, depending how you design your uh, space mission. For example, if we at UEC launch a satellite, uh, to fly over the UCLA campus and see how the Bruins prepare to for the football game against USC, it will be a satellite in sun synchronous orbit and in a repeating orbit. So, what does this repeating orbit mean uh, from the engineering point of view? Well, it means that the satellite would complete an integer number of revolutions around the Earth, M2 in this example, while the Earth would rotate n one time, integer times, underneath, um, uh, and uh, so that means one rotation of the Earth is one sidereal day. So we can just take a numbers orbital period of the Earth, we can calculate rotation angular rate of the Earth, regression of nodes, plug all of them into the formula, and we will get the ratio for n one divided by n two equal to 0.066284. So we can immediately notice if we choose N1 and N2 as shown here, 1 and 15 respectively, we'll get the ratio extremely close to the one that the Korean satellites achieved, 0.06667. So this numbers N1 and N2 would mean that a satellite would complete exactly 15 orbits every day, so once a day it will fly over the same point on the ground. So it seems that North Korea 
try to deploy a satellite into a sun-synchronous repeating orbit with daily revisits. It would be a logical orbit for a reconnaissance satellite covering their arch enemy, South Korea, the Republic of Korea. So, uh, as you, ca you s saw, the, the Koreans, North Koreans really knew what they were doing. They were trying to put a satellite in the orbit very useful to them, and they nearly succeeded. Their, uh, the error in the terms of deployment was only like 0.1 degree, we saw in the inclination. So, uh, sure, then the next or launch they will reduce this error. They are learning from the mistakes and they know what they're doing. So the technology is there. So now let's look at the launching of this satellite. So the satellite was launched from a launch site in uh, North Korea, which is in western North Korea, so-called Sohai Satellite Launching Station. And the launcher is, uh, as we said, a three-stage rocket, Unha 3 so three stage means so the first stage uh, is ignited and the, it burns all propellant. When the all propellant is consumed, the first stage is dropped. The second stage is started. The second stage then uh, and the uh, spacecraft and the rocket vehicle is being accelerated throughout all the time. The second stage is now burning all its propellant, turned off, separated and dropped. So the third stage starts, and the third stage takes the satellite to the final position into orbit, accelerates it to the desired velocity. So uh, the engines on the first stage uh, use uh, nitric acid and kerosene. This is the heritage of the old Soviet R-17 Scud. But we have to remember that nitric acid and kerosene are storable propellants. They are not cryogenic propellants like liquid oxygen. That means they can be stored for months and years in a launch vehicle, in a ballistic missile, in an intercontinental ballistic missile, ready to go on the moment's notice. So this is the propulsion system, propulsion combination of propellants, which is appropriate for an inter intercontinental ballistic missile that Koreans obviously want to develop. So let's just see what will happen if they would try to launch satellite directly in the orbit of their interest which is as we established sun synchronous orbit repeating orbit with the inclination 97.4 degrees this is essential so if we look at this trajectory shown on uh, this globe uh, with the launches from the North Korea there and it's a direct transaction trajectory that takes uh, uh, the satellite into the desired orbit the first stage would be burned out and dropped and splashed down in the yellow sea very close to the launch site. The second stage would burn out and it fly and drop down much farther. And the drop zone for the second stage would roughly be where the Philippines are at the Luzon Island. This is unacceptable for safety consider con uh, considerations and because of national sovereignty issues. So North Koreans could not launch a satellite directly into the desired orbit. So what are their options? So one option is just to launch a satellite straight down south, as the engineers would say, due south. In that case, the first stage would impact at the uh, Yellow Sea, and the second stage now would impact 300 kilometers east of Luzon, which is safe. And by the way, all countries uh, declare to the international bodies uh, their launch attempts and they sh tell uh, to everybody where the drop zones are so that the ships wouldn't go there. So this is exactly, uh, this is a public information where these drop zones are. And from this public information, we know that they launch the spacecraft almost straight down south in the direction towards south. But such an orbit will not put a satellite into orbit with inclination 97 degrees as needed, but it will, be in the, will end up in the orbit with 90 degrees. It's a wrong orbit for them. They want to be in some synchronous orbit, which is favored by reconnaissance satellites. So what they did, they launched a spacecraft due south first, and the first, uh, first uh, stage dropped in the Yellow Sea next to Korea, and the South Koreans actually fished out this uh, first stage uh, from, the, uh, from the ocean. The second stage dropped down 
300 kilometers east from the Philippines. So what they did when they separated from the second stage, the third stage not only continued to accelerate the vehicle to the desired velocity that is needed to be in the lowest orbit, but they also executed a maneuver turning the trajectory towards west. So this trajectory is now bent and it put the satellite in the orbit with the desired inclination 97 degrees and the accuracy that they achieved, or the error you may want to say, was only 0.1 degree. This is a pretty complex maneuver. It shows that they needed for such a precision maneuver, they needed to have a very good attitude determination and control of the, Earth, of the launch vehicle, and they have to have a very good navigational control. So this is a major challenge, precise guidance and attitude control of the launch vehicle, and they almost successfully done it, just only 0.1 degree error. You can be assured that the next launch would be more accurate. So it's again, it's a pretty sophisticated stuff, what they did, and this is very important uh, when we evaluate the, how much North Koreans could do. So now uh, let's just talk about conclusions of the whole story. So North Korea shows continuous improvement in and mastering of long-range ballistic missile and related space launch technologies. And the given North Korea's size, small size, small economic potential, complete isolation, and embargoes and international sanctions, it is a truly remarkable achievement what they did. So it is only a question of time when North Korea achieves indigenous intercontinental ballistic missile capability and also deploys satellites. Two months after this satellite launch, only a few days ago, three days ago, I think, North Korea conducted its third nuclear test. So you see how these two things are coming together, and again, they are showing very important indigenous capability. Now, dismissing, denigrating, and jeering at North Korea's real achievement is irresponsible, unfair, and consequential. It may lead to dangerous miscalculations by policymakers and the, by the decision makers. And I can tell you that, which is exceptionally important, that one does not need technology of 2010 to put the nuclear warhead half a world away. One needs the 50-year-old technology from the 1960. It would suffice. And one doesn't have to be a rocket scientist to understand this, and some of us are, and our students are the future rocket scientists. So this example shows how our students can learn science and engineering and apply it to, um, which will help them to deal with problems of the real world with solid knowledge. I am Mike Grundman. Thank you for listening.